You work at the glass house laundry? How's Paul now? I wasn't taught anything about it and, and later read a few lines at the bottom of the history book. And I think it's partly a symptom of inequality and the fact that these stories have been written out of our history and also the fact that it hasn't been on the big screen must be to do with us having so few female teams and it probably was going to be a female team that brought it to the screen. I mean, I think when you realise that the public records that reveal the level of police surveillance of um, this organisation weren't open until about 2002, 2003, that you realise that this has been something that has been suppressed and denied. So for us, I think it's been a real detective uh, job to kind of unpick all the research from an incredible body of uh, historians who sort of led that. But you come to realise that so many of these stories have been buried. Uh, and like Sarah, I was never taught it at school. Although I have an 11 year old girl who two years ago went for a dress up day and there were two suffragette girls, so I think that's quite reassuring. <laughs> debate titles. Titles are so difficult. <laughs> but we're pleased that it's called that because it's clear. <laughs>
and I think the great achievement of this film is that it's not about women of a certain class, like Emmeline Pankhurst, who worked as an abolitionist, as a, as a pro labor supporter of uh, the rights of working people, men and women. But it's about a working girl. And I think that's part of why we can enter the film so easily and so empathetically, is because Carrie plays this young long dress <coughs> who looks like us. The circumstances of her life were out of her hands. And, um, so, this is such an important. I mean, I think, I think what I always loved about this film is that um, it didn't feel like a documentary about a time, it felt like a film about today, and it felt, I always felt its resonance with where we are, and it's a film to mark the achievement of what these women did and what they gave to us and what they achieved, but also to sort of highlight where we are in the world and of course we still live in a society that's sexist and, uh, and that, goes through, um, that goes throughout our history. Um, but I feel, yeah, I think it's a, I mean I think for me it was a great moment to realise, really understand what women went through to get the vote and for, for me to be empowered. And, and also to, to, to sort of take another look at where we are today and, and, you know, obviously in this country, largely we're very privileged, but, you know, the fact that the film does relate to uh, and does talk about the rest of the world and where women are and, um, and just in terms of their vote and not in terms of their living uh, wages and, and in terms of the, you know, the way that they're treated and the, the marriage laws and um, I think we always felt that bringing the film back round to today and trying to make people think about where we are in society now was, was the most important thing about the film. And to give people an idea of the history and to, and to help them understand, but also to sort of open our eyes. And, and, and it's been, it's really done that for me. Um, and I work with a charity called War Child, who work with children in conflict, and they work with lots of women and lots of children. And, um, and I was at an event last night with them, and we all were actually, Sarah and Faye and I, and, and a woman called Pauline from Uganda spoke. And she was 12 when she was kidnapped by the LRA, and she was kept as a child soldier for seven years, and she finally escaped. And she found War Child, who, uh, who helped her and, and helped her get back into school, and she learned to read and write, and she had her education, and she said, education is empowerment. This is, you know, this, they gave me my life back. They gave me my empowerment. They, um, you know, and she spoke with such passion about what learning meant to her. and. Um, I think that just brought it home again for us tonight, you know, last night about, you know, what this film can mean to people. Sometimes things are circular. The less you see of the stories about the civil rights of women or the importance of women in history or what they achieved, if you don't see them, you are disheartened and you think, well, this is the way it always has been. Um, but to make a film like this, it will circle the globe. It will encourage people that have very little hope. People whose lives look almost like the lives in 1913 in, in London. Um, so yes, I think it's a, it's a great encouragement. Is there sexism uh, in, in the world now? <laughs> the lack of inclusion in the decision-making bodies in every single enterprise in the world. Whether it's what to do with refugees, why are the people making those decisions not half women? What to do about, um, I mean, the, the church is a body that excludes are two places you can't vote in the world. Saudi Arabia, although they're registered people, supposedly, and the Vatican. Um, that seems wrong to me. It, it, if um, men don't look around the Board of Governors table and feel something is wrong, something's just wrong, when half the people there are not women, then we're not, we're not going to make any progress.
because we're making progress from the bottom up. Coming to, in, in the United States anyway, more than half the people that are in graduate schools, law schools, medical schools, more than half the women. Business schools. But do they get to decide? Do they get to write history? Well, we had this cast, and none of them had worked together before. I can write about that. But when we got together to rehearse, we had three weeks of um, sitting in a room with Abby and, and going through the script and really discussing it. And the Kerry had done months and months of preparation before that. Um, they all immediately formed this bond. I had nothing to do with it. They became great friends. In fact, one of the problems was stopping them laughing and getting back to work. But um, so that was that was them. And there was an unusual sense of camaraderie. And I wonder whether it was because, well, one, we were telling the story everybody felt very passionate about, but also there was this unusual balance. Um, we had men and we had lots of women in, in, in key positions. And that was exciting. And it was also exciting to have lots of women on screen together. You know, often you'll have Meryl or Kerry, but not in the same, same scene. So that was all incredibly exhilarating for all of us. I think what's really interesting in terms of the collaboration um, when you work with actors so early on in this way. It's quite rare to get that length of rehearsal period with actors in film. I'm used to it in theatre, but not in film. It's that you make it as bespoke as you can for those actors, but also you start to listen to them because they are the keepers of character. And one of the things that's very interesting to me is that the great quote we use was no genius moment on my part. It was actually Carrie Mulligan who found it. And I think that's when great work happens, is when you truly start to collaborate with the intelligence and brilliance of actors and say, when they discover you the stuff and start to bring it into the work again. It was it was really amazing and it's a beautiful end to that film and I couldn't Olive Schreiner. Schreiner at the end quote and, and so I struggled to find that and so it really was down to the actors who collaboratively together really understood the themes of the film and I think um, had journeyed their way through it. So for me that was a really wonderful collaboration. striking how there were echoes. I mean, you know, she's she's endured so much and she's so brave, um, but there were, in terms of her language and the way her outlook and her determination, there were many echoes. I think what's been fascinating for me, and I've just spent the last month in America, is to compare the difference between the British suffragette movement and the American suffragette movement. And certainly in America, we have a huge debt to the many diverse women who are part of the movement. Um, I think in the UK, without a doubt, there is that association. However, I think it would be a pity if the negative connotations of that conversation, and it is an important conversation, overshadowed the true and sincere intentions of the film, which was to empower all women globally to believe in the, uh, the, the um, equality for all women. And so in a way, I think, that to me is a really important narrative, but actually I think the discourse is really important. And I hope that we don't negate on either side that discourse because it is vital that we keep talking about it. We had a competition run through women in film in New York, and um, there were many, many submissions. So many that we're going to do again next year, and next year, and next year. But it was really for women over the age of 40, who are often shut out of um, uh, the competition and uh, out of uh, getting their films greenlit. So I wanted to make that happen, make that happen. Um, there were eight finalists, the winner was a, a woman from Austin, Texas, and now she's uh, working on getting that film made. Well, I mean, I, I think Sarah can, I mean, Sarah and I have been on this project together for six years, but it's truly Sarah's passion project for the last decade, so that gives you some idea. Film does take time. However, I think a film where uh, it's fronted not by one, but an ensemble of women, and they're not being funny, is hard. And it's not romantic, it's hard. And so um, I think that became a huge obstacle. Um, we have an incredible uh, group of uh, producers at the front, at the Fay, Ward, Alison Owen, and our man, Cameron McCracken, uh, and I think of all of them as feminists, 
and, uh, and so it really has take, taken both men and women to bring this film to the screen, um, and for several reasons, and it's very complex, and I really would love to talk more about it, and I will be talking more about it when I talk more with the Fawcett Society about uh, pay equality, so it will be an ongoing conversation. I don't know if Sarah wants to add to that. Yes, I think that's right. You know, as Abby says, it's, it's never easy, but this was a tough proposition, but we wanted to stick to our guns, and, and we pushed through all the obstacles, but we did have champions, and we had these really tenacious producers who were sitting in the front row. We had uh, champions, you know, Tessa Ross at Film 4 in the early days, we had people at Focus, we had Cameron McCracken at Pathé, who makes, you know, political and exciting and interesting films, and often directed by women. So that's, you know, we, we were lucky to have those people around us. about a biopic of Emily Pankhurst for a, for a while and there would be an amazing story to be told. I hope that out of this subject, it's a huge movement that spanned decades, I hope there are many more films, but um, we thought if we, that, if we told that story it would be the story of an exceptional woman. What we were interested in is the story of the ordinary women, the women with no platform, no entitlement, the working class women who are so often at the vanguard of change, who rarely get talked about, and there were these extraordinary accounts as we mentioned but it's so contemporary feeling and we thought it was to follow that woman would make it connect with women all over the world today. Yes, um, I thought, yes, exactly, to sometimes history is written by the privileged class and the interesting thing about film is that you can look deep into, into lives that weren't written about um, and imagine what they were like, knowing what we know about their conditions and what they were what they suffered. So I think, as I said before, the, the way in to connect with the modern audience is not to have people in big hats with corsets and who look different from us, who look almost alien, but to have girls that we identify can more easily identify with. And it's a it's a it's an easier way in to the story to translate it to right now. Well, when we came to cast this film, it was very, very difficult because we kept on getting the call from agents saying the parts weren't big enough um, for men. Um, uh, so it's a huge tribute to Brendan uh, Gleeson and Ben Wishaw and, and Sam West and Finbar Lynch that they took on these parts. So one of the things I really wanted to try and do, that, and, and certainly Sarah and I talked about this a lot, was to try and, although they are smaller and supporting, um, they are complex. I think it's really interesting you say that because one of the criticisms we have is that's come up is uh, there aren't any sympathetic men and they're not sympathetic to the women. And I think one of the things that's really interesting is I think they are all going on their journey. Uh, and one of their journeys, I think, certainly for Ben, is to deal with the, the fact that he's a man out of his time. For Brendan, he's a man who's trying to uphold the law and he then starts to question the law. For um, Benedict, I'm afraid there's very little enlightenment, but we do see very clearly that he's a man who controls the wealth of his wife. Sam West. And there's Sam West's character, and then um, her wealth, sorry, her wealth, more importantly. Uh, and then with Finbar Lynch, I wanted to create a man who would have been in the men's league at that time, who would have himself been incarcerated at some point. And the conflict of that, which is when your ideology starts to really um, be strained by your emotional love for your wife. So I think it was always our aim to try and get the balance of complex and yet supporting roles for the men. But I, I hope that there is, you know, you see the character of Taylor, who was very much an archetype, but in some ways I saw that again and again in the research, which was those men who sexually abused their workers from a very long, young age. And I think we have to assume, also based on the research I did, that Maud was abused from a very, a very young age. So that's a very important facet in the film. And the Finbar Lynch character who's married to Helena was based on, there were three well-known couples where the men supported the women and, and there were a couple of men, well there's George Lansbury who resigned because of the uh, forced feeding, but there were also a couple of men who did go, a few men who went to prison and even one who hunger striked. So we wanted to show, you know, there were all shades of men, as Abby said. Yeah, I think about some of the things that they... One of the most shocking things to me was um, suffragettes who went into uh, museums and slashed famous works of art. And I think that is just... You know, they, they did, you know, lots of um, you know, big protests, but that just seems so terrifying. And to have the guts to do that is just um, astonishing. And, and, and that's just this one tiny thing in all the 
sort of horrendous things I went through. Um, I think, you know, I've been so lucky to grow up in a, in a, a generation where I haven't had to fight, on, or in a family at least, and in a, you know, in a sort of environment where I've had a very kind of lovely, easy upbringing, and, and I'm incredibly privileged in that respect, so I've never had to fight, and I think, I suppose, uh, what we feel about making the film, or what we feel about people seeing it, is that, you know, I suppose we fight for more equality, but we also fight for the people who aren't in our positions, and, um, and so I don't know if I would throw rocks for myself. I would like to think that I could throw a rock for somebody else. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a, I can't imagine the courage and, and uh, you know, the, the bravery that these women had. Um, it's just completely wrong as well. <laughs>
Actually, there are 760 men who weigh in on the tomato meter. Now, I submit to you that men and women are not the same. They like different things. Sometimes they like the same things, but sometimes their tastes diverge. If the tomato meter is slighted so completely to one set of tastes, that drives box office in the United States. Absolutely. So who are these critics, bloggers, and thing? I went on the side of the New York film critics. The New York film critics are 37 men and two women. <laughs> and then I started to go on all the sides of the critics thing. And it is, the word isn't disheartening, it's infuriating. <laughs> because people accept this as received wisdom. This is just the way it is. And you can take every single issue of feminine rights, female rights in the world, and um, examine it under the same rubric, because it isn't fair. So we need inclusion. We need inclusion. The tomatoes this year should say, it has to be equal. Have and have. We will win. Never surrender. Never give up the fight.